All right, so one of, the things, oh, yeah. <laughs> one of the things that you'll figure out, if you, you probably have already figured this out, is that all the various subjects and resources that we're going to be talking about through the whole permaculture design course are so strongly interrelated. It's actually a challenge sometimes to kind of take a slice and just talk about something like soil, as, as we did this morning with Josh, and the same for water. Um, so many of our techniques and the way that we're reading the conditions and our goals for our sites are so intertwined. So landform and soil and water are those. So I'm going to start with some information about, about water, trying to stress that from my perspective, water is one of the most critical things we need to understand and focus on on the landscape um, and some of the data related to why. And then try to segue into some water conservation and landform related things, swales and other stuff. So we'll go through this and feel free to bring questions as we go. Um, and I'll, I'm not going to talk to every slide, but one of the things we want to emphasize is when you think about the permaculture ethics, um, we're thinking about how we can be ecologically responsible and responsible to other people. And with something that's such a shared resource like water, it becomes really, really clear that we have a responsibility to be good stewards. So water. Um, just to put things in perspective, as Josh talked about how much life is in a teaspoon of soil. Um, when we look at water, we think about the fact that only 3% of the Earth's water is fresh water. We're the water planet. And so of the 3% that we have available to us, unfortunately a, a diminishing amount is tied up in ice caps and glaciers, but there's still a significant amount in ice caps and glaciers. About 30% is in groundwater, which is more difficult to access. Less than 1% is what we normally see, like the surface water, lakes and rivers and ponds that we see. And of that, the majority of it is tied up in water bodies like lakes and ponds, and a smaller amount in wetlands and in rivers. So the Northeast is pretty blessed with water, even though we're going through a bit of a drought right now, it seems, in the spring. But um, this is to start to put into perspective. If you're feeling like you don't need to be a serious water conservation minded person, we really do. And so to kind of, I guess have this in the back of your mind as you're moving through analysis and assessment of your own site later in this course and design solutions of your own site. We really want to stress water conservation and good water management. This is interesting. This is from NASA. So this image shows all of the world's water clumped as if it was a planet in relation to the Earth. That's the massing of it. And that's fresh and salt water. When you think about what a narrow lens of water actually exists on the planet, that I, I had to like, I was looking at the NASA website, I was reading the article, I just couldn't believe that the graphic was real. But when you think, check it out. So what it shows though is that there is such a finite amount of this resource and it's such a process to go through to clean it. And we have a tendency to waste it when we're taking groundwater, we're treating it to make it drinkable, and we're flushing it down the toilet. That's ridiculous. It is ridiculous. I wonder, it would be interesting to have that graphic on available topsoil. Whoa. Mm -hmm. See, see yeah. how big that is. Yeah. Wow, yeah, absolutely. A lot smaller than that. Even scarier. Okay. So some basic things, bringing back to high school science class, that water is three times more abundant than all other substances. It occurs as a solid, a liquid, and a gas. It has the highest surface tension of all liquids other than mercury. And what we're seeing outside of the U.S. especially is our country is facing water scarcity. People with a lack of clean and available drinking water. And estimates that a larger percentage of the world's population will lack clean and safe drinking water in the future. And consumption. Consumption is growing. There are more people consuming more water in different ways. Um, I mean, everything we do consumes water. Production of clothing, production of food. Um, golf courses. Golf courses. Yes. Recreation produces, consumes water. Um, so 
this is to keep in mind, you know, from a permaculture perspective, we want to do things that are going to be better for everyone. And that's going to be part of how we consume water, but also then how we also take responsibility for that water and treat it. Okay. Water cycle. What's going on here? Anyone have any idea? What are some of the things happening in the water cycle? Come on. Shout out to Mantis. I give you the diet. <laughs> I just have to read from it. Condensation. Condensation. Lots <coughs> the sun. The sun is an integral part of the water cycle. The water's doing this. Exactly. So you got precipitation, you have infiltration to some degree, you have runoff, hopefully not across bare soil. <laughs> you have water pooling, you have groundwater interacting with surface water, you have evapotranspiration. So yeah. Energetic cycle. Energetic cycle. And a cycle that seems to be changing. If you you know you follow the news and you follow word on climate change, it seems to be disproportionate how in some places are getting less and less of the precipitation <coughs> portion. In some places are getting way too much of it. So it's even something that we're seeing change, be affected by changes on the planet. All right. So we thought, think about how little water is available to us on the planet, and then think about this, that about 70% of all the available fresh water is used for agriculture. And it's not the type of agriculture that you're looking to do. It's more like what we see here with uh, this type of irrigation. And that overpumping of groundwater exceeds natural replenishment by at least 160 billion cubic meters a year. That is a huge number. It's a number that's so big I cannot wrap my head around it. And you think about it, how can overpumping exceed natural replenishment? What do you think is going on? The water table's dropping. The water table's dropping here because you're withdrawing from that water table. And where's all the water that you've withdrawn going? It's evaporating. It's evaporating. It's running over compacted soils and not able to infiltrate again and going into rivers and streams and exporting soils, nutrients, fertilizers, all this other stuff. So it doesn't actually go back into the system it came from. Mm. Haven't they figured this out yet? You can take all the unemployed people and turn this into permaculture farms. That's why we need you, Angela. <laughs> <laughs> you can send to us. <laughs> you see, you're a system stinker. Not it's everyone else is. and cost like 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 everything else. else. Yeah. <laughs> all right, so one of the first times I started digging into these these statistics and started working with it, um, this the fact that 160 billion cubic meters gets put out in the literature, but we don't know what it looks like, was kind of like boggling to me. So I'm going to show you what it looks like. All right, so this is a cubic meter, not water, stone, but that's a cubic meter, right? And we have 160 billion of those. You with me so far? This is advanced math in a permaculture class on Saturday morning. We need a picture. A distance. Of 96 million miles. What's 96 million miles from us? The moon. The sun. Oh, oh my gosh. gosh. That's crazy. Mm. So picture like this stream of water. That just, it, the stream of water, it doesn't leave the planet. But the stream of water can't get back to replenish the system it's part of. So, and we're seeing this even in Seacoast, New Hampshire. We're seeing where there's now a greater exporting of water clean fresh drinking water that's not returning to the water table because we water our yard or we wash our car it goes down the driveway it goes in the storm basin it goes out a culvert into a stream and it's out to a great bay and it's gone we haven't recaptured it that's we it. have solutions i'm gonna start hoarding water you should start hoarding water <laughs> <laughs> underground systems all right so we talked a little bit about watersheds last time did anybody really look into their watershed situation anymore or anything you want to share. So what are the things related to watersheds do we want to talk about? Do people understand the concept? Well, they're, about major, they're in the major river areas, right? Because when I checked into ours up in uh, Pittsburgh, yep. it's the Connecticut River. They said. You're in the headwaters of the Connecticut River. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. And within that watershed that your property sits in, there are sub-watersheds that are all collected. I don't know where to find that. I tried to find it, I couldn't. Some of it you simply have to just by looking at topographic maps and walking the land. 
And yeah. you can see as Josh took us around the first kind of the orientation here, he started showing watershed divides where the land slopes. Oh, in this so there's direction. no name. I mean, I, there may I, not be. A name. I've done enough topo work to know. I mean, looking at the property, I just couldn't find names or anything. Right, because no one's taken the time to assign okay. the names. To so the I can name it myself. It, you can. And it, the watershed maps too are. <laughs> they don't have a tendency to show a lot of. Like I had to do two or three different maps to actually figure out where the water that left my property, where it goes. Okay. Because they don't have a lot of reference. Like one had some roads on it. Right. Another one had no roads at all. Huh. Um, so it's a little hard to reference exactly where you're at. I don't know if you guys have a thing like this in New Hampshire, but the Agency of Natural Resources in Vermont has this really cool mapping thing you can do online. You click on all these layers, so it'll show you the topography, it'll show you the watersheds, it'll show you the like all forests, I don't know, different stone types and soil types, like there's layers, all this stuff, and you can just... Zoom in, zoom out, and move around. And I we do guess. have it. It's very. It's like a. It's a GIS, geographic information interface on the computer. That's very user friendly. We have it. It's through Granite, and it's called the Viewer. It's the New Hampshire Granite Viewer, I think, something to that effect. But yeah, it's, you can click on and look at water resources and other things, and zoom into your part of your community. Yeah. It's handy. It's a really helpful, like visual. Well, look at this image. It was right up here. What they're showing with the yellow line is that any water that lands inside that yellow line eventually makes it here. Mm -hmm. So this picture, that could be the Connecticut River for right. you. Um, but within that watershed area, there are ridges where water feeds to smaller bodies or streams and things like that. So you have this as a sub-watershed within the larger watershed. This is Angela's watershed within the Connecticut River watershed. Mm -hmm. And then you have areas that are urbanized, areas that are farmlands, areas that are vegetated, all of these are bringing different types of nutrients or, or potentially pollutants to the same water resource. And one of the things, I've been working on a watershed study for six years in the Newfound watershed, which is 63,000 acres, and there are five primary towns. And one of the things that we learned in that process is that Newfound Lake, which is a very clean, pristine lake, is aging a little bit faster than it would naturally because of phosphorus. So phosphorus, <clears throat> mostly from disturbed soils making their way into the surface waters and making their way into the lake, those sediments, fine sediments coming off roads and logging operations and things like that. The phosphorus comes in and it's part of creating a lot of growth and part of the natural progression of a lake to a wetland or another another natural form over time. Mm -hmm. So we're looking at how do you use better land management practices to control entering phosphorus to the lake. But it could be other pollutants that you're looking at as well in another, another watershed. So basically the water, this might be a really silly question. There are no silly I'm questions. Sure this. So in that picture of the watershed, so basically all the water is coming from the highest point, like the source is basically up there. Right. 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 Okay. There can be some groundwater interplay that gets a little bit more confusing because groundwater can be moving in mm -hmm. from one place to another. But this is for all surface water. So if we don't get a lot of snow in the high lands, right, and we don't get a lot of precipitation in the sky, we're pretty much screwed in the basins. Right. So what happens in you know the Great Plains where when you don't where you don't have the mountain? Caps to start what are their watersheds? They're just they're bigger, flatter watersheds. You still have topography. You still have a change. So, in in some cases, in some places around the world, the the headwaters to the watershed may be really far away in a mountain range that you don't really feel you have a connection to, where there are glaciers melting and there's the snowpack that Angela talked about. Um, but what's happening there is impacting your water available for irrigation and things during the growing season. Hey, think about the grand scale. The Mississippi is right, more or less, in the middle between the Rockies and the Appalachians. And one of the so one of the things you'll see here. Look at the patterns of the streams as they move up the watershed. How they break, they branch. It's the same patterns we see in leaves. Mm -hmm. These dendritic patterns, and we see them in our own body. You start to see how the natural systems are really tied in, and how this is a, just a little bit on natural patterns, but just recognizing that we see it in 
in trees and root systems as well. This kind of branching. So you can picture watersheds too and how they start with really small pieces and they then water gathers into larger and larger systems. Um, we've just already kind of touched on this a little bit, but this is huge. I mean, the idea that polluted uh, runoff is the number one water quality issue and that typically in more developed landscapes, we're seeing systems that take all of this storm water and gather it into a collect and convey type of strategy where we put it into a storm basin and then we take it out to a stream with no treatment. Um, so this is a problem that we want to get away from. And this is what's going on. Typically, with the water cycle, in an undeveloped natural ecosystem, about 50% of the water is going to be able to infiltrate the groundwater or into the soils, recharging the groundwater. And you get about 10% or so that's just going to sheet flow across. And you have water that's being taken up by plants, and you have water that's evaporating. But you have this interesting situation where you have a, a lot of it, a lot of, this is an overgeneralization, but a lot of the water can actually make its way into the ground. Whereas in an urban system, it flips the situation. Where now the majority of the water is likely to be running off. It's picking up velocity across hard surfaces. It's taking with it deposits from automobiles, salt and sand and other stuff into the nearby water bodies. And a, a lesser amount is actually able to infiltrate through vegetated areas, landscaping, cracks in the pavement, places like that. So we want to be sensitive to this because as we're, as humans, as we're making changes to our own sites and our own neighborhoods and our own towns, we have a tendency, we have the ability to actually change the situation from a water perspective in a really negative direction. Um, meanwhile, we could be providing treatment for that parking lot and providing landscaping with habitat generation or food production and stacking these functions, dealing with the natural systems while still having to provide maybe parking at this point in our history. Okay. Some of the stuff that I'm going to share now, um, I'm going to, I'm going to make a note. We have a handout that I'll send out to you guys too um, that has some of this, so don't feel you have to write it all down. But it's from some of it's from Brad Lancaster, and Brad Lancaster um, is handout. he's a permaculture designer in the southwest portion of the country, and his big focus is on water conservation and water in the landscape. And so he's he's written a whole bunch of books that I think you've got some of the. Um, Dry lands stuff here. Maybe we can pull them out. Um, he's written a lot of a, a lot of literature on capturing and storing water and treating water naturally on the landscape. Um, but what we tend to see is that we have these phases. So we have a phase of catchment. There's an opportunity to to collect and catch the water. We have the opportunity to store that water. That could be rain barrels. That could be in the soil under your mulch. We have opportunities to use it, you know, for watering, just passively watering the plants that we've introduced or the forest garden, or collecting it and using it for washing, drinking, flushing, other uses. And we have this responsibility to have the water be as clean or cleaner than when it came onto the site. So really thinking about the cycle of water collection and usage on the site. And just be keeping this in, in mind when you're thinking about your site and the rooftops and the driveways and the vegetated areas that you have potential for catchment and storage and usage and revitalization on. Steve, yeah. my, my husband last night mentioned, and I'm embarrassed to say this, uh, I didn't know this, but in some areas of the country, you, it's illegal for you to catch and store water in your own property that mm -hmm. someone else may have rights to the water that come onto your property, so you can't have rain barrels. Right. Do you by any chance know how prevalent that is? It tends to be more in the West, where yeah. there are a lot of water rights issues, and where um, places like Los Angeles are counting on a very large catchment area that's well outside of their watershed. That's why you want to buy property. Can you imagine? Right next to protect the land. <laughs> and it's, I mean, part of it too is it, it is changing, it's being challenged, and it's changing slowly. But here you have a situation where you have places like in Colorado where it's easy to get to a drought condition pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. And there are you know, places that are saying you can't do water catchment for your own use on your site because it, 
it belongs to other people downstream from you. And then you have places like Australia, like in Brisbane, you can't do new construction without doing can. water catchment wow. <laughs> because they understand that it's important to capture it as close to where it's where you're getting it, store it as high in the landscape, and then use it as many times as possible, and then get it back into the land. Mm -hmm. So, but yeah. There was a controversial. Um, is it Bolivia? Is it was it Bechtel? They bought the rights to the water, the, the rainwater. Yeah. And um, who and sold, the distribution. Who's it? Well, the government sold it because they were so so in, they were so well, in debt. Were... All they had left to sell was was the rain out of the sky. <laughs> And, and the people who were living on two dollars a day were spending a dollar a day on water, oh and, and you know there was crack. I mean, it's been overturned. There was practically a revolution on it, but yeah, yeah. they came in and that's installed the infrastructure. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. But even even here in the US, I just yeah. Know my Most people don't know that, so don't beat yourself up. Yeah. So we want to increase residency time on the on the property. We want the water to be used as many ways as possible. And so we basically want to slow it, spread it, and sink it. Um, UNH has started to say vegetate and infiltrate, which is great. It's right. great that that – I mean that's easy to understand that you can add more vegetation to your site and give – with the right soil conditions, give the water the chance to actually make its way back through the soil to be treated by the, the root zone and the microbes and back into groundwater. So increasing residency time on the site is the exact opposite of putting all your water down the driveway into a storm drain and out. That's expediting, ex expediting um, the loss of water. We want to collect it as high as possible on the land so then we can use gravity and time and have a, a slower solution to how we deal with our water. The best place to store it is in the ground. There may be other places you also want to use it in between, in rain barrels and cisterns and other things. But basically, if we can get it into the ground with good soils, with good cover, good mulch, that's the best place for it to be. It's going to be on site the longest and available to plants. If you're trying to flush your toilet, not so good in the ground. Better in a tank and then in the ground. So you have to think about the details of this based on your design. Slow. Spread, sink is kind of the mantra. So when you're out walking your property and looking at water resources for your design and doing your water layer, which you'll be doing starting in August, um, you want to kind of think about, like, how can I slow down the water at various stages of the landscape? How can I allow it to spread out and then be able to be managed and, and sink through the soil? Okay, so this is... A description from a permaculture perspective of a site um, and stewardship. This is from Brad Lancaster and I'll read it. He's painting a vision. So this site passively hydrates itself by harvesting and infiltrating rainwater, runoff, and gray water on site, reducing downslope flooding and overall water consumption and contamination. The need to pump water in is greatly reduced or eliminated. Leaf drop mulch is also harvested and cycled back into the soil and plants further, increasing fertility and water holding capacity. This leads to an enhancement of resources and celebration due, due to the re resulting abundance. Very different from how we traditionally see development deal with water. So this is part of like how we're going to change our perspective and the lens that we have from a permaculture perspective of how we look at the landscape and how we design interventions on the landscape. So keep this, this vision in mind. And these are the steps that Brad, this is a more detailed version of the steps that are on the handout um, that you'll see that have a lot of... Um, they're basically an adaptation of permaculture principles. So there's a lot of overlap. So in looking at water on the landscape, the steps that Brad has put together are to begin with long and thoughtful observation, same as the observation phase in the permaculture design, to start at the top of the property, or even better, to go beyond your property and start at the top of the watershed mm -hmm. so you have a sense of what water is coming to you and where is it coming from, what kind of land uses there are, those things. Mm -hmm. And then on your own property, you start to slow it, spread it, and sink it as high up as you can and work your way down. Small and simple. 
Low tech, easy to maintain. Spread and infiltrate. Plan an overflow route and manage it as a resource. You want to think about when that pond or rice paddy or rain barrel gets maxed out by the 10 inch storm, where does the water go? And how do you do, how do you handle that water and, and provide for that overflow so that it can be directed to a, an appropriate location and not create another problem with erosion or something else? Flood your basement. Maximize living in organic ground cover. Maximize beneficial relationships and efficiency by stacking functions. And we're going to look at, we're going to do a little exercise up here where you can look for how you can maximize beneficial relationships. And continually reass reassess the system. Because things will change over time. And this will be on the handout. <coughs> What's going on? Let's assess the system. What's going on in the system? You got water coming from the ground into. Actually, you got water coming off the roof yep. into the ground. And they got water coming from the hose <laughs> into a bed. Right. And that, what is that, a sidewalk? Yep. So they're catching the water from the sidewalk. Actually, the water for the sidewalk is moving across the next plane. Yeah. Into whatever that is. The road. Oh, is that a road? Is that the road? road? The big oh, okay. the road. What was that? Oh, yeah, they're losing lots of water. <laughs> it's missing the trees. Missing the trees. Yeah. <laughs> tree <laughs> rings don't allow for water to Except get Except for the water they pour into the tree bed. From the town, from the hose, yeah. What else do people see? Yeah. Fertilizer. Big bag of fertilizer yeah. sitting on the lawn. Yes. <laughs> Compost on the side. Yeah, all yeah. the organic yeah. material is going to be carted away. Yeah. It looks like water. <laughs> Are these good things? <laughs> and Beacon Hill. Yeah. yeah. And you see all the see all the sand and like yeah. deposits on the sidewalk just being washed away. Yeah. Soil. Yeah. All right. So what from that from this from this image to the next what changes? Uh, they get rid of the no tree rings. Yeah. yeah. Tree rings. More plant material. Put some plants. The tree rings are lower, so all the water is going to the tree rings rather than away from. They did something with the street to divert the water. <coughs> they cut the curb. Mm -hmm. Cut the yeah. curb. Yeah. Put a curb. I've never yeah. seen that. Yeah, yeah but yeah. Uh, so now they're actually going to get water up the sidewalk. They cut the curb, so like actually where the curb was stopping yeah. the storm water from coming yeah, into yeah. their site, they cut it and allowed it to flow in. They started to actually take excess water into the site to hydrate the site. And something's sleeping over there. The, the hose is sleeping. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> the hose Boring, is sleeping. very plant material. Too. The trees exploded. The trees yeah. are great. Oh, I see birds now. Birds are there. Oh. Yeah. Oh. No more trash. I mean, so this shows through some pretty simple interventions how you can totally change the situation. That's cool. Um, mm -hmm. It's fantastic. So, this is Brad Lancaster's house, the house here, this is in Tucson. This was before, right? This is before. So, what happened, this is just a little story. So, Brad and his brother bought the house for a dollar because it was in a high crime neighborhood. And basically, there were gang related issues and people didn't want to move in there. Um, there were a lot of problems with, with crime, and you had two young guys experimenting with permaculture and not a lot of money, so they saw the availability to buy a house at auction for a dollar and said, great. They moved in, and they started to retrofit the house. They wanted to build soil, plant gardens. This is in Tucson. Not a lot of water when you want it. Right. They started to capture water from the roof of the house and like really want to be a model for how you could create an oasis in this desert city. And one of the things they pursued was this like, from the fence line to the curb, this big kind of no man's land, um, is part of the city right away. And so Brad reached out to the city and said, you know, what can we do in here? We'd like to build gardens, we'd like to do different things. And they said, you can't do anything in there, that's city land. And basically, you no, know, leave it alone. Pull your trash out to the curb, be a good <laughs> resident. That's the sidewalk, I just realized. It's basically this big dirt patch of the sidewalk. Yeah, it's all I get. So there, are, in any permaculture design implementation, you have to make some decisions about how law-abiding you want to be. Yeah. <laughs> they decided that they wanted more instant results, so they got a large uh, cement saw, and they went out in the middle of the night, and they cut 
into the curve. So just like the image where you saw the cut in the curve, they cut into the curve and they started saying that they realized in watching the neighborhood and how things happened that when they did get those inundating rains, that the water would get collected in the road and would be taken off to a nearby stream and it was gone. It wasn't available to them anymore. But then if they cut the curve and they created depressions and added organic material and vegetation, they could introduce that street stormwater into their site and start to hydrate the site. So they, middle of the night, cement saw, cut the curb, made friends <clears throat> with all the neighbors, have no problems in the neighborhood with the neighbors. Well, they the guys. Yeah, and they think these are plank geeks and they're probably harmless. So they go forward. Wow. And that's it. Uh, so one of the things that happened in doing this was that the city noticed. <laughs> and they the values went up. <laughs> they received they received a visit from a city inspector who wanted to know what it was they'd done. And nice. now in Tucson, if you want to do stormwater capture and you want into your landscape, the ability to accept and treat and infiltrate stormwater, the city will come out on request and cut the curb. Yeah. Does it cost you a permit fee? I don't think so. Wow, that's pretty good. <laughs> so public works actually saw what they were doing was actually a better solution than continuing to build, you know, stormwater collection capacity. That trying to start to use the sites adjacent to the roadway and the storm drain system was better. So now they <clears throat> they're not growing a lot of edible stuff there with that. I don't think that was their focus. Okay, because yeah. I mean, the one thing that you get down there too is a tremendous flush of hydrocarbons and all of that because you don't get much rain. So everything right. pools on the asphalt and then when you do get rain you get these big flushes and Absolutely. everything. So yeah, having a natural buffer there, I mean, you couldn't get a better filter for all of this. And it's habitat and it's and starting it's to create cooling yeah. for the house in a hot environment. So what they wanted to do is they wanted to have a natural way of cooling the site hydrating the site, creating habitat in the site, and then I think you're right, Jack, that there are better places on the site where maybe you have some of your edibles, um, or you grow things where the hydrocarbons aren't going to get transferred from the woody material to the fruit, mm -hmm. um, and the soil's going to be, the soils and the mycelium are going to be the appropriate place to break those down and process them. Then you get a fee now for walking through botanical garden. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 That's you know, great. one part of this too is a lot of times these collection systems go down to a pump system and needs to pump it someplace else, and there's an energy component to this too. Mm -hmm. Right, yeah. less Absolutely. water goes down there for pumping. Right, and you don't have combined sewer sewage overflow issues. That's you right. know, where you're treating stormwater yep. and mixing it with your other. Wow, that's amazing. So just as an example, so there are other places, other ways you can capture and store. Did people know the calculation for capturing rainwater? Hmm. Um, a square foot of roof, or I should say a square foot of solid surface, in a one-inch storm, you can collect basically a half gallon of water. It's 0.6 gallons. So picture every square foot of roof or driveway, you can collect a half a gallon of water in a one-inch storm. One-inch storm is not that rare. <laughs> but you start to do a calculation of your roof area you can start to see how large a cistern or a series of tanks you would need to be able to accommodate that and how much overflow you might have. This is what you can't do in California. Because of... Cannot. They won't. I have a couple of friends of mine that love They cannot do that. Right. So you're free they, of that. You're free I of that worry. Mood. I'm public this in the underground, even in California. So how much rain do we get here in the Northeast, in the places Fine. you're living? Do you, anyone know the amount? Uh, yeah, 42 is Plymouth. That's the figure yeah. that we're told. In the 40s, yeah. So if we're getting 40-something inches, picture the square footage you have available or you could have available as your design goes forward and picture all the opportunity. You may, may not choose to capture it all or use it all, but it's available. You could just build a huge carport or actually an oak just to capture water yeah. before it hits the ground. In a permaculture system, it'll have more than one use. Well, yeah. It'll be st you store your cars. You yeah. you know maybe have renewable energy systems. Maybe capture water. Like yeah, you have a bunch of these things. Yeah. It's the same on that. We get out of our well. We don't have a very high pumping well. You get a half a gallon a minute. Do you really? So you got to get slow at that way. Storm, <laughs> it would be a shower with that. Well, 
Well, I mean, you know, it's 400 feet down, so there's all like, you the drill storage actually. tank is big. It's not like there's only half a gallon available. Uh, but, I see what you mean. Um, I well, it's secondary storage. Okay. Yeah. yeah, usually what they do, if you only hit a half a gallon, they'll drill down deeper. I mean, we often kind of watch the well companies because they, yeah. they, they make like money. to drill down deeper. Right. <laughs> they get to charge you. But, yeah. So you build capacity there. Uh, okay. So just some other strategies. Green roofs. Green roofs are a possibility to protect the roof membrane with soil and vegetation mm -hmm. to, as a result, make the building more efficient from a heating and cooling perspective because mm -hmm. you're adding a little more insulated layer. But also picture the soil layer and like we talked about with the wetlands, Hannah mentioned wetlands, picture how much, you mentioned as well, you mentioned for, was it a yard of compost? It was 160 gallons? 160 gallons of water per yard. So, so, so picture if your roof was not a rubber membrane, but it was four or five or six inches of soil, and not every roof's appropriate for this. I was just going to say, that's <laughs> no, a special design. We're just you talking see concept the, right yeah, now. Yeah. You have, have to consider do it now. The yeah. roof and get into the loading on it. No, right. Right. Mm -hmm. I had a situation with a company down in Milford, and they had a zinc problem on their roof. Not really, <clears throat> it wasn't really a toxic level of zinc, but sure. it was higher than the receiving body, and you can't be higher than the receiving body. So we created a rain garden at their outflow, yep. and we used some metal ox socks in it, and that's working. Still doesn't really totally meet the capacity. But when I started trying to talk to them, because like, we could put some socks on the roof with plant material on them, zinc-loving plant material. And we can remove the stone that's there right. and put a, we can design a sock that won't weigh any more than that. So there's no structural component to it. There's no... But try to get them to understand, well, we can't filter the water because we'll retain too much. Like, I don't want to filter the water. I just want to grow plants up there that love zinc, and then we're going to harvest the plants off of there right. once or twice a year. And we're going to remove this. The zinc is in the stone. Okay. And we can naturally reduce, over a period of a couple of years, we're going to naturally reduce the zinc load on that roof. Getting an engineer to understand that. Yeah. Is Challenging. Challenging. <laughs> yeah. Well, and picture some of the other benefits of a green roof. You have <laughs> stormwater storage during big rain events. You don't, it doesn't all come off quickly out of the gutters. It's being stored and slowed through the vegetation and the soil. Some of it's being taken up by the vegetation. Some of it's going to be given back off into the system through transpiration. Um, and you have the ability to create habitat or places for public to gather, or maybe if the building is strong enough, the growing opportunities like you see in Brooklyn and other places now, urban farming on rooftops. But this is just another, it's another tool, it's another strategy in some cases. And then here, like we'll be doing this afternoon, just this idea of sheet mulching, adding mulch, adding organic material to get that water into the ground and hold it in the ground and not let it just, the sun just bake it right back out. So we want to start to think about store, catching and storing water in different ways. This is the acres. 2025. <laughs> <laughs> That's probably Japan. So this is kind of the entrance, like starting to think a little bit, how does landform play into this? I mean, this was done extensively because it was a way to capture and slow water and use it on the landscape. Um, so this is an extreme example just to get your creative juices flowing. So how is that done? That's not rock bed. I've never been to this site. Oh, you mean you put the picture up and you don't have an explanation? Yeah, yeah. I would think <laughs> it's, it's a lot of hard work. It's Students 101, you're supposed to be able to I'm going to show you a more realistic right. picture, though. I'm well, not suggesting you do this in Pittsburgh. Uh, oh, I'm thinking about doing that. Well, then I'll go to your site and I'll have a picture from here. Well, i got plenty of slope for it. That is a good example. Of, we don't do a lot of living walls. I mean, I'm going to build yeah. a living wall at Green at Gunstock this year. Um, but living walls have been around in Southeast Asia and you get down into New Zealand and all, they're not afraid to build green walls at all. Right. Um, and they've been around parts of the Great Wall of China are green walls. Yep. But that's probably some stone. Rock. This is stone on the lower stone, layer. Yeah, then... It looks like some kind of rock and soil. Uh, and then flooded patties. Yeah. We have a really steep slope that gets most of our sun, so we've started terracing. And okay. What we do um, is we get an old lumber that's not 
pressure treated and just build, put that as the first layer of yep. facing and then start building up with rock as we pull it. And are you building garden beds on the stairs? Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, they're garden beds now, and we just keep adding the rock so that once the mm -hmm. the wood rocks away, it'll be just a rock yep. facing that'll hold right. down. I'm actually starting to do that on a portion that I've got with the I'm using old logs, but that's effectively what we're going to do with one hillside in the pasture there. It's always been a perennial problem. And wow, and as the logs start to break down, they're adding mycelium to the soil. Yeah, that's, that's just so many benefits. Whole, yeah, yeah. Um, that project is just getting started. So I don't know. This is a. Yeah, go ahead. In Bali, it was just straight, they would, you know, cut straight down the dirt, and then they let the leaves grow at the, at the edges. Okay. And then they, would, they let the weeds grow up in between in between cropping and then they would just go through and cut up and stomp them down to the mud with their feet just, you know, just to drain mulch it. But it was, it, there wasn't, I didn't see any much stone at all. But the roots were holding that soil. Yeah, yeah. it had to be. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, it didn't look, it looked like they would go through and freshen it up when they were killing the leaves. But yeah, the wild strawberries have moved in. Uh, I don't like that so Sure. Mm -hmm. Well, and this is a more typical way of capturing slowing and sinking water in a permaculture system, which is the use of swales. So the whole idea being that you start at the top of your slope and you create this depression and then the corresponding mound down slope from it. And what it does is the water stops at that point, is gathered during like a real peak rain event, it has the chance to infiltrate and become available both in the groundwater but also more locally to the plants that are right there. And so Depending on the slope that you have, you may have more or less of these, and the distance between them is, is critical because you don't want to allow for large areas on a steep slope that are just going to collect so much velocity that they're going to blow out your swale. Mm -hmm. But you tend to start at the top of the hill and work your way down, building these swales, and one of the critical things is that they're on contour mm -hmm. so that they're flat. So that water that comes in then doesn't run down the swale. This is different than like a a drainage ditch or another way of maybe when we want to move water. This is to say we want it to become flat, we want to take the energy out of it, and we want it to be, have a chance to infiltrate. So we want it to spread itself out across that contour. So we show this because swales are, swales are a very, very basic way that we can start to capture um, with a landform. We can start to capture water, we can start to build the soil. But for some reason, they seem so mysterious to so many of us. So show this image, and then I wanted to show this one. Same idea. Um, this one I don't like as much because for some reason they decided in the graphic to fill the swale with mulch. But I think what it can show is that over time, you actually start to get some depositing of organic material and building of organic material that maybe you can harvest from the swale as well. This idea that we're providing an opportunity for infiltration and for food production or habitat generation, or other goals that we may have on this. <laughs> but yeah, you got your A-frame, you know, you're sitting there, and then you have a piece that's sat across. Mm -hmm. So there's three pieces of wood, and then there's your pendulum is suspended. And you get it somewhere where it's nice and level, you use your level on the ground or something, and get it level, and then where that line crosses your stick right here, you mark that. Mm -hmm. And then, so as you're figuring out your slope, if it's going down slope, the thing's going to be a little off, you know, your pendulum. But if you're going with the slope, parallel with this slope, it should be right in the middle. So you take your, your one end and then the other, and sort of, you're, you're leapfrogging it along the slope. You just walk the Walk in the yeah. stick. Oh, yeah. okay. And so, although, then you connect those marks. Okay. To mark it with sticks or flagging or whatever you have. Okay. And it'll you'll see it may it may not follow what your eye think of. I mean what you want to do is even if it were to be off by an inch or so over ten feet, that's yeah. a relatively small amount of change. Okay. Um, and hopefully you're gonna be dealing with swales that are vegetated. Mm -hmm. So they're also gonna have the ability to slow and sink water. But you don't want over ten feet, you don't want to be dropping off by a foot. Okay. then it's going to start to so get velocity and have a, more of a belly. Okay, so a couple of inches per 10 feet then? Is that a good... An inch or less? You want to be pretty less. close to being okay. on the same Got elevation. It. Okay. You want to aim to be at the same level. It's not a flow where the lowest point is. 
It'll find it. That's why you can do um, I would prefer to keep it flat and go yeah, all the way across the slope. Flat. Anywhere you concentrate yeah. flow, you've got issues. Uh, the use of ponds. This is get a permit. Whole systems design. You're going to get a permit, yeah. depending on the size. But the use of, use of ponds for capturing and storing, and especially building flood capacity, the ability during a flooding event to s capture and store, the energy of the water on the site, create habitat, create additional food production opportunities. Same for rice paddies. Um, having this overflow space to absorb, kind of be like a shock absorber or a sponge during a big rain event, capture that water. You know, help meet your needs, provide treatment to that water, revitalize it, and then return it to the system, either through the soil or through an outflow or through evaporation. Yeah. And then we're not going to go deep into this because I think we're going to have a, another conversation oh, yeah. more about composting opportunities, humanure, gray water, but recognizing that water coming out of the structures, so gray water being one of those and what it is, um, that's another opportunity for us to take responsibility for the water we're using and provide treatment on soil, build the health of the soil, and revitalize the water at the same time. We're, and you're part of what is primarily, for the Baker River watershed, an undeveloped watershed. I mean, it's not as covered with impervious surfaces, but you get to like 10% of the watershed being covered under buildings and parking and stuff, you can, are considered an impaired watershed. Only 10% can greatly impair the quality of the water, the surface water. Yeah, so they're really artificial systems for infiltration and filtration. Yeah, yeah. So I think what we're looking for is to replicate those with more natural, more enduring systems, more resilient systems. I think the real themes that we're struggling with are the desertification, and the flooding, it's, it's feast and famine here mm -hmm. that we're facing. Right. And so, uh, to get where we need to get, um, we need to sort of look, uh, rethink this conventional goal of the expediting the dispersal of the water and working more towards the infiltration. And so, um, it's, a, it's a design goal. <laughs> and so, head that direction. <laughs>